Welcome, welcome, welcome. The beauty of the Lord in the mountains of West Virginia. Oh my, oh my, oh my. How beautiful, how beautiful God created this world to be. But can I remind you that everything in this world is muted and tainted by sin. As beautiful as this world is, especially in autumn in the mountains of West Virginia, it is the, the colors are astounding. But the true colors are nothing compared to what God created color to be. We are only seeing through a mirror dimly the beauty of this world. Mm. I cannot wait to see what the beautiful true color of God is is like when I get to get, when I get to heaven. I mean, I cannot wait. My friends say I live in a state of passive. You know, I can't I can't wait to go. I just live in a, in a state of, of passive, wanting to get out of this world. And I do. I, I, I want. I am homesick for a land I've never seen to a God I I love. I cannot wait to go. But I am struck by the fact that I, 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 music has been most of my life. Um, uh, uh, I pursued music, I uh, study music, I play music, I, I sing, I play a lot of instruments. Music's been a part of my very core. My grandmother played piano, my mother played piano, my older sister played the piano, we all played instruments. My dad played the radio. <laughs> that, that's what my dad could do, he could play the radio. But I have a heritage of music in my life. And I have a prayer partner who is an incredible artist who has opened me my eyes to the world of color and shades and subtleties and lights and shadows. And so I am my the 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 senses are are alive in this world for me when I hear music and when I see pictures and colors, but it's nothing compared to what I'm going to see when I get there. And to hear the voices of angels, even just to hear the physical voice of my Savior. It's worth, it's worth, it's worth it all. Going home makes everything here worthwhile. I'm not going to get out of this world until God says it's time. There's, I can't change a life, a breath of my life. I can't add a breath to it. But when that, that day comes, I'm ready. I know I'm ready. Are you? Are, are you ready? Do you know that at that moment for sure, that when God calls you home, that you're his? If you don't, I'm just going to start right up front. If you don't know for sure. We want to help you be sure because it's the greatest trust. It's the greatest uh, appointment that I've made with my, with, in my life is an appointment with God to be with him in eternity. It's the, it's the choice of my life, but it has to be a choice. And if you haven't made that choice, we want to show you who Jesus is and how to get to him. He's waiting there for you, and he loves you so much. And he's beautiful beyond description, and so is heaven. I have a message today that came out of, seriously, out of a childhood cartoon. A childhood cartoon has led me to this study. It's called Four Carts and Eight Oxen. And I'll get to that at the very end. But there's a tribe. Uh, Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, had 12 sons. His third son was Levi. And Levi had three sons. The third son was a, a son named Merari. Now, if you know anything about me, I have been a Scooby-Doo fan for all my life. I was a collector of Scooby-Doo. I, I just, I, it just made me smile. Even as a growing a, a adult, I, I was just fascinated. I just love Scooby-Doo. Can I just, I just like Scooby-Doo. I think one of the reasons I liked it is because there was never anything bad because all the bad guys were phonies and fakes, right? There was never real intrinsic evil in it. It was just a bunch of kids 
who got to the truth, and there were good guys and bad guys. I, I liked that part of it. Anyway, Scooby has a speech impediment. Scooby has a speech impediment, and everything is ours. Renny, Raggy, Ruby Roo. Well, so Murray Rye sounds like a Scooby Doo tribe. It sounds like a, a tribe that Scooby Doo. We're talking about Ruh Roh, Murray Rye Roses, like talking to Moses, Moses, Murray Rye. So I'm putting all that in you so that you remember the name of Murray Rye. It has nothing to do with Scooby Doo. I'm just trying to draw a picture or paint a picture so you remember Murray Rye as a tribe because it's not one of the names that we're so familiar with in the Bible. But I want to show you about this tribe of Murray Rai. It's, it's a fascinating, powerful story about serving God. So Jacob had 12 sons. One, two, three. Reuben was first. Levi was third. Levi has three sons, and they become the Kohathites, the, Ger the Gershonites, and the Murrayites. Okay? So there's three tribes. These three tribes, the sons of Levi, these three tribes have very specific jobs that they are to serve the Lord through. They have very specific calls on their lives. They were given by God through Moses, and they, I, they were told what they were going to do their entire lives. They were in charge of the tabernacle of Moses. You know, the tabernacle, the one that had the outer court, you know, into our gates of thanksgiving, they had the courts of praise, then there was the holy place, and then there was the most holy place, and that's where the Ark of the Covenant dwelt, you know, where the priest could go in once a year to make atonement and sacrifice for the nation of Israel. They had the table of showbread, they had the, the, the golden lampstand, they had a brazen altar. We know the tabernacle of Moses. And the physical responsibility for that tabernacle fell upon the sons of Levi. Gershon, uh, Kohath, uh, Gershon, Kohath, uh, Kohath, Gershon, Merari. It fell upon those three families of the tribe of Levi. Now, I want to show you this picture. So look at Numbers chapter 4, verse 4. Numbers 4, 4. This is the Kohathites, all right? This is the service of the sons of Kohath in the tent of the meeting. This was their job. The most holy things. Oh, the job, the job of the Kohathites was the most holy parts of the sanctuary, of the tabernacle, the Ark of the Covenant, the table of showbread, and all the other holy, precious, beautiful things. Can you imagine? What's your job? Oh, I'm responsible for the most holy articles in the whole tabernacle. What, what a, a, a solemn responsibility, but what a privilege to serve in the most holy things of the tabernacle. That was, that was the Kohathites. Now, the Gershonites took care of a different aspect or a different part of the tabernacle. Look at Numbers chapter 4, verses 24 through 26. The Gershonites, they shall carry the curtains of the tabernacle and the tabernacle of meeting with its covering, the covering of badger skins that is on it, the screen for the door of the tabernacle of meeting, the screen for the door of the gate of the court, the hangings of the court, which were around the tabernacle and the altar and their cords, all the furnishings for their service and all that is made for these things, so shall they serve. Again, you have the Kohathites, their responsibility are all the precious holy things that very few people would ever get to see. 
and the Gershonites. They had responsibility for the beautiful curtains. Now we know that those curtains were blues and violets and reds and whites. And there were cherubim on them. They're just beautiful and magnificent. And it was the Gershonites' responsibility to carry and to care for the curtains and the furnishings and the cords. The cords were woven gold or gold threads. This was their responsibility. And then we get to the tribe or the family of Merari. This is chapter 4, verses 31 and 32. And this is what they must carry as all their service for the tabernacle of meeting. A two by four. Yep, that's it. They get to carry the two by fours. Look, they carry the boards of the tabernacle, its bars, its pillars, its sockets, and the pillars around the court with their sockets, pegs and cords with all their furnishings and all their service. And you shall assign to each man by name its items he must carry. What? What? The older brothers carry these amazing, amazing, phenomenal, astonishing furnishings and parts of the tabernacle. And this poor part of the family carries the two by fours or the four by sixes. They carry poles and sockets and wood. And you're thinking, boy, I feel like that. I feel like there are people in my church who get all of this attention or get all this blessing or if someone gave $10,000 to the church and they get their name recognized well I'm struggling over here and I'm giving you know $10 a week because it's all I can afford it's all I have to give God and you're not being recognized there's somebody over here who gets to sing a special every couple of Sundays and I'm stuck in the choir just in the back row of the choir I am the tribe of Marirai a lot of us feel like that. A lot of us feel like the tribe of Murray Rai. We got, we got shorted. This just wasn't right. How come somebody else gets all the better stuff and I get stuck carrying a two by four for God? Can I say to you that that's part of the problem we have in churches or in the church? The name Murray Rai comes from a root word that means bitter. So here, your name is bitter, and you're forced to carry two by four. What's your name? Bitter. What do you do for God? Fourth, bar, fourth board on the right. That's my job. I carry that fourth board over there. That two by four, yeah, that's my job. But my name is bitter. This is the lot of Merari. Do you remember the story of Ruth and Naomi? Naomi had left um, Bethlehem with her husband and two sons, went to Moab, spent 10 years in Moab. When they were in Moab, her husband and both sons died. She comes back to Bethlehem with her daughter-in-law, uh, Ruth. Her other daughter-in-law, Orpah, stays in Moab, but Naomi comes back with Ruth. And when they, she comes back after 10 years, there is a hustle and bustle. There is a, a little frenetic energy in the town of Bethlehem. And they say... Could that be Naomi? Is that, is that Naomi? And Naomi says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Because God has dealt bitterly with me. Merari, Mara, means bitter. And I can just see a bunch of people in the church, bitter Merarites. I see them. I have them, uh, uh, not in my ministry, because I have, I have people who serve just out of the love of God. Ah, just the love of God. Whether it's, we have a, we have a, we, our office is next to a frat house. And we have a woman who bakes brownies and cookies and cupcakes and cakes almost every week for the boys at that frat house. That is her call. And she does that humbly, but lovingly for God. Uh, I'm on national TV. She's baking brownies, but she's not a Murray right. 
she just understands the power in that, just ministering to a bunch of young men. Listen, we're good friends with those neighbors. Those same boys at frat house, every year they invite the women of our ministry over to their frat house for a Thanksgiving dinner. They make they make turkey and mashed potatoes and all of it. They dress up in nicer clothes. I mean, they even have ties on. And they pray before they eat with us there. This is what her brownies have done. It has forged an amazing friendship between a bunch of old ladies in ministry and a bunch of young men at a frat house. Only God can use, can use her in that way. Bitter. Bitter. See, that's what I think a lot of people are. They're bitter because they're not the chosen ones in the front of the church or they're the unsung prayer warriors who are sitting in their living rooms interceding for the pastor and the, the choir director or the worship leader. There are people who are giving tithes and offerings without anyone else knowing that they're giving and they're not being recognized. And year after year, they're doing it and they're serving, but there's a bitterness growing in them. There is an absolute bitterness growing in the church. The Bible says in the last days, there'll be jealousies. Uh, Second Timothy talks about what the last days look like. And it talks about in the last days, there'll be lovers of selves, lovers of pleasure, jealous. This is what we're seeing. We're seeing people who are fighting for position in churches or fighting for the right pew or the right people, the right friends. You, we see it in schools with cliques and being in the right group and not in the right group and being made fun of because you're not part of the right group. And then you become jealous and you get bitter. And bitterness is a horrible root and it, it digs deep into a person's life. But then there's this tribe of Mererai. And the root means bitter. And so they get up every day. They get up every day and they say, we, we're going to serve God, but boy, our name's bitter. <laughs> our name is bitter. And we, all we get to do are two by fours or poles or wrenches or sockets or a pair of pliers or a hammer. This is our lot in life. But can I tell you that that was not at all the attitude of the Murray rights? Not at all was that the attitude of the Marerites. You see, the same root Mara or Mar in the Hebrew, we get the word bitter from it, Mara, Marerai. But the other side of that root is the word Myrrh. Myrrh. You know, frankincense, gold frankincense and myrrh. Myrrh. It's a bitter herb. It's, it's a bitter herb. But did you know that myrrh is used in the um, mixing, in the mixing of the oil of gladness? Yes. Myrrh is used in the mixing of the oil of gladness. You see, that's what God does. When you serve God out of a heart that just loves and wants to serve him, he can take what might be bitter circumstances and turn them around to an oil of gladness, to a joy. Can I show you the scripture? This is Isaiah 61, verse 3. Isaiah 61, verse 3. To appoint unto them that mourn in Zion... To give them, here's the exchange, beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. A tree of righteousness for the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. Murray Rai's service has to do with the house of God. Hear me, those of you who Murray writes out there who are a little bitter right now, hear me. The tabernacle is a foreshadowing of Jesus. The way it's set up, the way it's, it's um, you navigate through it, it is a picture of Jesus and his life. 
The only thing holding up Jesus are all the boards, all the sockets. You see, you can live without the beauty, can live without the color, can live without the gold, can even live without everything else in the, in the tabernacle. But there's no tabernacle without something holding it up. Those of us who don't, don't serve in huge ways, public ways, visible ways, you're holding up the rest of us. You are holding up the rest of us. When you give into this ministry, when you support me, when you support your church, when you pour into some family who just lost everything in a fire, when you do that, you are supporting the church. You are the ones holding it all up. You are the ones for which nothing else can, can be held and strung unless you are there holding it up. Without you, there is no tabernacle. There is no church. Church. There is no kingdom without the without you holding it all up. This is you are you are supporting, you are strengthening, you are steadying everything else so that those of us who are doing what we're supposed to do can be a witness to Jesus of Jesus in this world. Without you holding us up, we cannot do, we cannot be a Gershonite or a Kohathite. We cannot be that without you. I, I served as a Marae right most of my life. And there were times where I would look and think, well, you know, God, I'm studying, I'm working, I'm doing all of this, I'm, I'm striving to serve you, and, and, and what, what, what comes of it? And God said, Jenny, do you not know that where you are, you're holding it all up right now? There may be no one else in your church holding it up like you're holding it up, but you are holding it up right now. Praise God. Praise God. God. Praise God. Now, let me give you one more picture of Marerai. The Kohathites had to carry everything on their shoulders. They had to put poles on and carry everything on their shoulders. The Gershonites were given some help, but the Marerites were given the most this is Numbers chapter 7, verses 6 through 9. Numbers 7, 6 through 9. So Moses took the carts and the oxen and gave them to the Levites. Two carts and four oxen. Two carts, four oxen. He gave to the sons of Gershon according to their service. But look here. Four carts. And eight oxen he gave to the sons of Merari, according to their service under the authority of Ithamar, the son of Aaron the priest. But to the sons of Koath he gave none, because theirs was the service of the holy things which they had to carry on their shoulders. A lot of responsibility comes when you are carrying important things on your shoulders. But God gave something to the Marerites more than any other of the, of the two. He gave them four carts and eight oxen. In other words, yes, they had to carry all the poles and all the two by fours, and that was their lot. But here's what happened. They got to carry it and put it on the cart and let the oxen do the work. They could just walk behind it, make sure it didn't tip over. They, they had nothing on their shoulders. They were given more than any of the other tribe, the three tribes. They were given the most to do their work. Can you just say hallelujah and shout praise God for that? That they were given the most to do their work. Four carts and eight oxen was theirs. The Kohathites had to carry it all. The burden was on their shoulders. But the Marerites, they had someone carry their burden for them. See, this is a beautiful picture of all of those, all of us who are supporting the church, supporting the work of Christ. You all are doing amazing things, and God is supplying everything that you need to hold us all up. He's supplying your need for the work of everyone else. Does it seem fair? 
how it does to me. Uh, uh, there's no fair or unfair in God, right? There just is not. Everyone has a lot or a place to serve him. And the Morayrites had this beautiful place. And so they don't get up every morning and go, oh, my name is bitter. I'm, I'm carrying that, that board. They get up going, I get to serve God in a way that no one else can. I am holding up the whole tabernacle. And I am, I, there's a confidence in me. I am upright. I am serving God in the way that he has asked me to serve. Not in the big ways or in the special ways or in the the favorable ways, but I am serving my God. And my reward is that he is giving me all I need to serve him. And I don't have to carry the burden that they carry. Praise God. We need Moray rights. There there are enough Gershonites and enough Kohathites in this world. Uh, The my call is not because I want it to be something, you know, not just a Bible study teacher in my hometown. I mean, that's all I did for years and years and years and years. But God elevated me. He exalted that. It was not my choice. It was his choice. But he did it knowing that I had Murray rights around me who were supporting me as I go and do this. We need more Murray rights. The church needs more Murray rights that aren't bitter because they get the, the lesser jobs or the lesser recognition. Great is your reward, Matthew chapter 5. Great is your reward in the kingdom of heaven. All three of those sons of Levi were rewarded equally when they get home. No one gets a bigger crown. They get a crown for doing what God's called them to do. Your crown is not bigger than mine. Mine's not bigger than yours. The reward is great for those of us who are called to serve in whatever way we're called to serve. And he loves that one who serves out of love and humility. God's calling Moraites. He's calling Gershonites. He's calling Kohathites. He's calling you. He is calling you. He loves you. If you do not know the one who calls you by name, his name is Jesus, and he wants to love on you in a, with a love unspeakable. And it's a beautiful picture, one brushstroke at a time. God bless you. Thank you for watching today's program, One Brushstroke at a Time. If you have been blessed by this study, would you share your story with us? We want to hear how God is moving in hearts all around the globe. If you have a question, would like more information, or would like to request prayer, please visit our website at brushstrokeministries.com or connect with us on Facebook at Brushstroke Ministries. You may also contact us at Brushstroke Ministries, P.O. Box 2353, Buchanan, West Virginia, 26201. Join Jenny Fister every week at this time to hear a fresh revelation as she paints a beautiful picture of his word, one brushstroke at a time.